Hello, everybody. This week was a quite heavy week. We addressed many issues related to international humanitarian law. So we'll end each week by an interview of, of an expert. This week, our guest will be Professor Marco Sassoli. He's a professor at the University of, of Geneva. He's a well-known expert in, in IHL. He has worked on many important projects in that field. So, Professor Sassoli, we are very happy to have you on board in this course, in this MOOC. And uh, so we would like to hear you, hear about your reflections on the general issues we address in, the, in this MOOC. And one of the first issues we have looked at this week was uh, whether international humanitarian law is really law, uh, is really binding law. So my question is, do you think that uh, it is not a paradox that the purpose of ICHEL is to regulate situations of armed violence, sometimes of high intensity, although those situations seem to be the negation of the law? Well, indeed, it's more difficult to obtain the respect of international humanitarian law than of international telecommunication law. But I think it is even the definition of an armed conflict, that it is regulated by rules. And that is the difference between a crime and an armed conflict, that an armed conflict is regulated by rules. And the general question, whether international law is law, well, it dep depends how you define law. And some people, coming from domestic law, imagine law is only something which is regularly enforced by sanctions. And this is not the case for most of the rules of international law. But humanitarian law is simply a branch of international law and has all its weaknesses, but also its forces in our society. And I think international law would not be complete if it didn't also regulate the sad reality of armed conflict. So you think that the, at the heart of the battlefield it's possible to, to, to belligerents to, to, to limit their conduct, uh, even if uh, it's a kind of irrational uh, situation. Well, this is the problem that if it gets purely irrational, then it is difficult to get the respect of rules. But the idea of an armed conflict is to remain precisely rational. And I mean, this is an effort, the military, but also armed groups make to keep a minimum of rationality because otherwise you don't win if you don't proceed with a minimum of rationality. And therefore it's in the interest of those who fight to respect rules because otherwise there's total chaos and total chaos is not useful even from a military point of view. Thanks a lot. The second issue we, we addressed in, the, in this course, in this MOOC, is, uh, it was about the history of, of IHL. Uh, it's a very brief history of, of IHL. So how would you summarize that, that history very, very briefly? And what are the, the, the key moments for you in the, in the evolution of, of IHL? Well, I think it's a very long history. And uh, one thing which is true is that uh, often, most of the time, the treaty law, and in my view also the customary law, is one war behind. Because it is taking into account the humanitarian problem which arose in a conflict that states, hopefully, the last 50 years this didn't happen, um, adapt the law to new uh, realities. And it's very rare that we have regulations which avoid something which never happened. Mm, yes. And so, historically, uh, can we, as we said in the MOOC, uh, we can uh, put the, the beginning of the modern IHL to the development of the Red Cross and, 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 and such events like that? Well, perhaps because I come from Geneva, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't want to overemphasize Henri Dunant. Be the only thing which was really new with Henri Dunant and which is threatened today is the idea that enemy uh, wounded soldiers are no longer enemies and therefore even uh, by uh, caring for them one does not 
uh, contribute to the military potential of the enemy. Uh, but I mean the idea that civilians are protected, that uh, uh, war should not be as indiscriminate and, and so on. These ideas existed in all cultures and at all times, but these were mostly either religious rules or bilateral treaties. So it was only us in the rest of international law. The idea of codification in multilateral treaties came up I, in the second half of the 19th century. And it came also up in international humanitarian law. Okay, if, and if we talk about more contemporary issues, and uh, could you point at any area of, of, of contemporary IHL where we, we might see uh, some developments in the near future? We would need developments, but the sad thing is, but perhaps I'm too pessimistic, I hope I'm too pessimistic, is that today states are no longer ready to adapt the law to new challenges, especially when it is hard law. So the only possible perspective is to agree on both best practices, new interpretations and all these things. But this is also a general phenomenon in international law. So it's not specific to uh, humanitarian law that perhaps the era of the great codifications is over. And this is particularly regrettable in humanitarian law where we would need universal rules which are adopted in a transparent way. So the third issue with Examine is about the relationship between IHL, which is also called Ius in Bello, and uh, Ius ad Bellum. So we know that those relationships are characterized today by this principle of separation between these two bodies of, of law. So is it still relevant today? What happened before? And, and so is it, is it still valid today also? Well, I think it's a very important principle, which is very difficult to get accepted uh, on the ground, in the field. And I mean, when I tell my wife, for instance, that our son, who is a Swiss soldier, because everyone in Switzerland has to make military service, is a legitim it's legitimate to kill our soldiers if France attacks Switzerland, she is shocked. And in my experience with the ICSC, uh, a lot of people uh, in the field are shocked when we treat them, uh, telling them, look, for us both parties are equal, because they don't feel such an equality because of the use of Bellum. They are convinced we are fighting for a just cause, we were attacked, we are unlawfully occupied, and we only defend ourselves. But it is essential, as you know, because otherwise humanitarian law would never be respected because it's always controversial who is right and who is wrong. But perhaps today it becomes even more difficult to have this accepted because of the asymmetry, both in terms of material means, but also morally between the parties, eh, between Boko Haram and Nigeria, to say both are equal and both have the same rights and same obligations, it becomes slightly difficult. It's much easier with the Syrian regime and the Islamic State, because they are, I would really say, they are equal. But you see, the, the point is, when it moves to the idea of more an international or domestic police operations, the police and the criminals are not equal. Why? Uh, because the police is subject to all kinds of human rights uh, restrictions, while the criminals simply may not commit crimes. That's the difference between an armed conflict and outside armed conflict. And the more the armed conflict as such becomes a crime, the more difficult it is to have this separation accepted, which I think is nevertheless essential if we want to have a minimum of respect in armed conflict. So, so your conclusions are also relevant or, uh, uh, for the, the, the peacekeeping operations, the United Nations peacekeeping yes. operations. I think we consider that are legitimate mm. operations uh, by contrast to the others.
But you see, I mean, if Switzerland defends itself, it's also legitimate under international law, but no one, uh, even the Swiss, claim that they don't have to comply with IHL if they defend themselves. <laughs> so thanks a lot. So the final issue we uh, have looked at this week is about the relationship uh, between uh, human rights law and, and IHL. So what are, in your view, the main uh, common features, but also the differences between these two bodies of law? Well, as you know, uh, the two branches developed separately. They have had originally a different philosophy and still today many rules have a different structure because in uh, human rights it's about subjective rights while humanitarian law is more objective law, rules of behavior for parties and for individuals. But the result is in nearly all situations the same. So today, the non-respect we see in many armed conflicts, it's not a problem that they apply the wrong branch, but they simply don't comply with any rules. It's only, in my view, in non-international armed conflicts and only on very few issues that really the two lead to different results and there, in my view, one has to try to reconcile the two and to determine for every situation which rule is more adapted to the situation. So I would say while for lawyers the relationship between the two is a very fascinating issue. In reality, the problem, say in Syria, if instead of IHL they were complying with human rights, everyone would be happy. And if they were not at all complying with human rights, but with IHL today in Aleppo, well, ev not everyone would be happy because the armed conflict would nevertheless be there. But uh, the fate of the persons affected would be totally different. Mm -hmm. So, in your view, there are no really practical problems which may arise yes. or... Uh, yes. There are. There are, for instance, the issue of uh, when a member of an armed group may be killed, the rules of IHL and of human rights law are different and therefore we have to determine when one or the other prevails. The same thing is true on detention because in human rights law it is essential that uh, a person may only be detained, detained with judicial control and it is controversial whether in non-international armed conflict under IHL we can apply the same rule than in international armed conflict for prisoners of war who do not have any right to have a judicial control but who are interned for an indefinite time, which is until the end of active hostilities, and no one knows when that's, this is. And here there is a real clash between IHL and human rights law. Uh, but I think the real question is, does IHL of non-international armed conflict uh, contain the same rule than IHL of international armed conflict? Because for prisoners of war in international armed conflict, I think it's rather reasonable and uncontroversial that they may be detained without an individual procedure because anyway they are not detained uh, for individual reasons. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot for those uh, reflections and now we would like to, to ask another kind of, of questions more about your personal experience because you, you practice uh, IHL and at the same time you're a professor. So I'm sure that students would be very fascinated to, to hear a little bit about your, your, your personal experience. And maybe we could start with this, this question. Uh, what are the difference, the main differences between working in, in academia and, and, and working for, for very practical projects? Well, I'm a little concerned about the growing a gap between what academics write and what uh, practitioners are concerned about uh, and also how little practitioners consult what most academics write but also how little academics are concerned about the uh, 
practicability of the of what they write. I don't know, for instance, to suggest a new convention on long-term occupation, do they really think that states would ever say, okay, if there is long-term occupation, then we do this? No, states will always say, we don't want occupation. But maybe we need some idealistic ideas to yeah, yeah, push yeah, states exactly. no. uh, further than they, that they, mm. they could do. And, uh, yeah, yeah, but reality check is often an important thing. Uh, but also, on the other hand, I mean, uh, I see it in some humanitarian organizations where they even say, oh, let's hire people who do not know too much about IHL because otherwise they will not be pragmatic enough and too much shocked mm -hmm. about what happens mm -hmm. uh, often in the field. But I think practice can also make us optimistic because I must say, for instance, since what I see in the media about Syria depresses me very much. While when I was in the field, both in the former Yugoslavia and in the conflict between Iran and Iraq, I have seen a lot of instances of respect. But obviously NGOs and the media, understandably, they don't speak about this. And therefore, in my view, there is, if you are only outside, you have a wrong impression that IHL is most of the time violated, while as all rules of international law, most of the time it is respected. Simply, unfortunately, it's not often enough respect. And this comes back to our first question about the respect yeah. of IHL, yeah. and sometimes not so much violated as we, yeah, as yeah. we say, of course. So another question about your, your personal experience, maybe just to ask you, how, how responsive are the governments to, to the views of experts, such as yourself? Well, I must have colleagues who are much better than I, because my personal experience is that governments and NGOs are looking for experts who say or write what they anyway want to hear. So to influence a government or an NGO, even a humanitarian NGO, to say don't do this, do something else, is very difficult. While where I see uh, an important uh, impact of expert is that those of us, and most of us teach, uh, our students then go to work for governments, for NGOs, and they got a certain idea on how the law works. And this has an imp more impact, much more impact, in my view, on how states behave, because states are abstract entities. It's human beings who work for states, and those human beings are trained by us from the academia. <laughs> So, Professor Sassoli, many thanks for having accepted to be part of this, of this MOOC and for sharing your views, your thoughts on, on IHL. Thanks a lot. Welcome. <laughs>